Good morning and welcome to the Gibbs CEO Flash Forum. Today I have a very, very special guest. Somebody from a very interesting industry that we all consume on a daily basis. Some of us consume it a bit too much, but nonetheless, business is business. Allow me to welcome, and please allow me to just give him a new title today because I, I don't want people to lose interest because they think he's acting. He's not acting, he's being real, he's here, he's in front of me. Allow me to introduce and welcome the CEO of Prime Media Broadcasting, Mr. Geraint Chris Williams. Geraint, oh. good morning and morning welcome. Much. Thank you for having me. So I did some homework about uh, who is Geraint and apparently you are Enid's husband. Um, <laughs> <laughs> don't know if your wife knows that you're in it. She doesn't, husband. but this is perhaps not the best way to tell her. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently in Old Welsh, your name means old man. Yes. Yes. So tell us about your name, because I recall the first time when you met, we met, you, you, uh, you were very clear to help me to pronounce your name properly. Um, what kind of pronunciations typically come with your name? There are a multitude. I'm not sure we have enough time. <laughs> I, I can remember growing up in boarding school yeah. in the days when you could still make a reverse charges call. And of course, you had to give your name a bit like being an inmate. And uh, <laughs> they would phone your parents and say, will you accept reverse charges call from Graves Willemse? <laughs> Durant. Uh, and sometimes there'd be, I think, a long pause on the other end of the phone. So I'm not sure that I know this person. <laughs> So it's something that I have a lot of uh, empathy for people with. Absolutely. So hopefully I will remember to say it properly, because as I said, I have my experience with Welsh um, when we first met. Today's topic, however, is the role of broadcast media in shaping good governance. Now, of course, when we think about the media, some people will think of the media as the fourth estate and a very important institution in society. And I'd like to start there broadly, uh, to ask you about the role of media in society and then we will shift into uh, the business of media from the perspective of prime media broadcasting. So in your view, given where we are geopolitically, uh, how would you assess the role of media today in our time in this moment of 2020? Well, I mean, I think you only need to look at what's happening in South Africa, what's happening in America to realize the importance of the fourth estate. Uh, I think that media faces a huge number of challenges. I think there are actually a number of parallels that we can draw. Uh, but talking in a South African context, I think that media owners have uh, a very large responsibility to keep the population informed, to keep the citizenry informed, to make sure that they report in a very balanced way that they present particularly from a radio point of view and, and arguably even more particularly from a talk radio point of view, uh, a very balanced set of facts, uh, provide a platform that people feel able, uh, th that they are comfortable, that they are free to express their different opinions. Uh, and I think that's crucial. You know, the evolution of a society, I think, is dependent on people feeling that they can express themselves, um, that they are able to, uh, it's not only about freedom of association and movement, I think it's freedom of thought. And I think that's what talk radio is particularly important um, as, a, as a medium uh, for in this country and around the world. But I think that media in general has a significant responsibility to safeguard the constitution uh, and the civil liberties and rights of its citizenry. So in a context where people read less, um, and if they do read, they really want to read less, uh, yeah. 140 characters or less. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, how is radio positioning itself, particularly talk radio, in that context? Well, I think it's a unique medium in that it's one of the only mediums that allows for, for two-way interaction, um, barring this one, perhaps. <laughs> but, uh, Thanks to LinkedIn. <laughs> that's right. Um, but I think talk radio, particularly 702 in this country, uh, for a long time has been, um, you know, a de facto public broadcaster. Um, and I think that responsibility is not lost on us, not lost on EWN as well, Eyewitness News. Um, and I think talk radio has a responsibility to provide a safe place for engagement, for debate, 
um, and for people to air their views and for us through the concept of the fourth estate to hold those in power to account be they in government or in corporate um, roles and so on I think anyone anybody who can have a substantial influence over the country and its trajectory needs to be held to account and I think that's what talk radio can do lovely so you mentioned some of your brands um, I, I, I don't I think we uh, more or less in the same generational space but I remember when I was at high school uh, I used to wake up six o'clock in the morning to 702 the morning zoo <laughs> <laughs> that is a while ago. it is a it is, it is a while ago so as you know also I I mean the field of strategy so I'd be very interested to know strategically um, how your your portfolio management perspective whether it's the products that I'm familiar with or the assets that I'm familiar with in the Gauteng region being 94.7 you can see I, I, in my head I had high felt <laughs> 94.7 and, and and 702 for example as well as the ones that I'm less familiar with um, in in the Cape um, like KFM um, and Cape Talk and so forth strategically how do you conceive of these assets and and what role do you are you are you hoping for them to play and and who do you have in mind when you're thinking strategically for these assets yeah i think so 94.7 has evolved into <laughs> 947 um and look i mean these are assets that have now been in our group for some time as you'll appreciate uh 702 has its roots in the old apartheid era as you know uh, had to broadcast from outside south africa well not from a technical point of view but where it was physically uh, located. Yes, I remember um, a friend of mine, a former colleague, Dan Moyane, was yes. part of that story, part of Lorenzo Marx, part of exactly. this whole conversation way back when, absolutely. So yeah. I think, you know, these four radio assets we've had for some time, I think the trick is to make sure that they keep evolving uh, in terms of what society requires, what listeners require, but it's obviously, as you'll appreciate, very different for a music station than it is for a talk radio station. So I think they, they fill different roles. Both of them are there to entertain, um, but music radio in our instance is also about just bringing a lightness, bringing some relief, bringing some humor, and obviously bringing you know, excellent music uh, to our audiences, whereas talk, as we've already started to discuss, occupies a very different space. So one of our um, viewers, listeners, as the case might be, it's Tepo Moncho, who says, morning. In the U.S., we have a clear distinction between Fox and, let's say, CNN in terms of their stance. Um, I'm not sure if he's American because he says we, but nonetheless, um, do you see SA Media eventually shaping itself in a similar fashion? I certainly hope not. Uh, and from a prime media perspective, from both a, an Eyewitness News and a 702 and Cape Talk perspective, we will not allow that to happen on our watch. And I think that's the essence of the responsibility that we've already started to speak about. I, I think along with many other people, have been flabbergasted by the blatant partisanship of the media platforms, and those two in particular in America. Uh, and wh whatever side of the continuum you fall on, it can't be good for society uh, to, to have that division in media. Um, so from a prime media point of view, we will fiercely protect the independence of our editorial teams. Uh, and I think that that's essential to a functioning democracy. Yeah. So talking about uh, quality and independence of editorial teams, I speak firstly as a consumer. And, and I feel that in a South African context, it's quite variable, right, in terms of the quality. And, and I wonder to what extent that might be informed by business considerations. So uh, um, do people, do media uh, moguls like yourselves, do you say it doesn't make sense for us to have these best people working for us, uh, I'd rather have them as outsiders and freelancers because we just cannot carry the cost? Or are there other considerations? Or is it a function of we just don't have that many great uh, journalists, uh, talk show hosts, uh, and so forth. So what is driving the, the, what is the economics and the logic behind this variable quality in our industry? I mean, I can speak in generalities. I certainly don't think it's the latter. I think we have an abundance of extremely talented journalists and investigative journalists in this country and extremely talented presenters. I don't think there's any issue there whatsoever. I think the, 
what the newsrooms are going through in this country at the moment is not unique to South Africa. But as you allude to, it is a funding issue. It is about how does this make business sense? How do we uh, monetize news content? And you've seen recently um, big companies, big newsrooms moving their content behind fire, uh, paywalls. Um, and that is something that we've decided not to do um, at this point in time. We think we have a responsibility to try and make our content available to, uh, to the uh, broader population in this country. But I also understand why people are pursuing those models. Um, I think you know, the support of the SABC, and you had recently seen the white paper, and them exploring all sorts of new mechanisms to collect uh, annual licenses, I understand. Um, because I think the SABC is a, a very important platform in terms of connecting and educating uh, and making news available to, to the whole country. But there is a hard reality that for private corporations who have newsrooms, they have got to be able to monetize those newsrooms, that content, um, and, the, uh, and cover the operating cost. And I think that's what you're seeing being explored in very different ways by different companies at the moment. Um, uh, and then how would you assess your strategic choices around the quality of your newsroom? Um, because um, certainly I, I, I'm sure I'm not rubbing you up and uh, blowing smoke at you when I say I think EWN is a great platform from a quality of journalists and a quality of media. But what informs uh, the, the strategic choices. You can't be all things to all people. So what, what mm. focus areas do, have you elected mm. to, 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 yeah, what areas have you elected to focus on? Let's put it that way. That's a very germane question yeah. because we've been wrestling with that for the last six months. Uh, and I want you to know that I completely agree that Eyewitness News is a, <laughs> is a, new, a leading news platform with some great talent. Uh, what we've decided to do is to focus on areas of particular concentration and speciality that we think are of great importance to the country and to our listeners uh, and our uh, consumers of the content online. So that would be us centering a lot of our resources around uh, crime reporting, around political reporting, uh, economic reporting and so on. So really concentrating on silos like that to be content matter experts in, to have the best people uh, in the country generating the news and stories and of course then amplifying that content on air from an analysis point of view which is really important. Yeah. So if we, we talk about this, this notion of freedom and that freedom of an, a media player in the sense of a journalist, talk show host and so forth also then has a particular focus in terms of which customer are you focusing on? You'll notice I'm sticking to my strategy questions because that's my wheelhouse. So who are the customers that uh, your brands are focusing on? So if we, we can start off perhaps with the talk brands and then the more entertainment brands. Is there demographic differences between these customers and what kind of attributes are you looking to target in each? Well, from a talk point of view, I mean, any business has target markets and segments its target markets into niche audiences so that you can market to them, so you can engage them, and so on. And we're no different in that respect. But from a talk point of view, we really are reaching out to those people who want to listen. So I listen to the people that I care about. I listen to the people that I care about because I want to grow. desire to learn and to grow their knowledge base and so on. From a music point of view, it's obviously uh, more about entertainment, it's about great music, it's about having a lot of fun. We've just relaunched um, on 947 the AM Drive show uh, on Monday morning, Anelia and the Club, and that's just all about giving people a break, giving people a time out, letting them tune in so that they can zone out, listen to great music, great fun. Uh, with Anela and Frankie and the rest of the team. That's a crazy um, team. Uh, can we just agree that it's they, a they're not normal? I mean, if they were in here, uh, this place would just be like exploding because I've never met them, but just to listen to them on radio, 
they, they sound amazing. <laughs> like no, and they followed in their footsteps of people like Darren Simpson, who Absolutely. we now have down on, on KFM. Yeah. And, and they're just the energy, the enthusiasm. They just blow things up and have an amazing time. I yeah. love listening to them. Yeah. So uh, talking about that, so in the context of how the industry has changed over time, uh, uh, it seems to me for the longest time, the prime media assets didn't really have much competition. Um, um, because it was in terms of other private broadcasters. And, 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 and more recently, certainly over the last 10 years, definitely the last five years, competition has been quite fierce. Um, how has the competitive landscape reshaped how prime media broadcasting views itself and, and how it, it feels it should view itself into the future? I think our competitor set has changed and has broadened dramatically over the last couple of years. Um, so by way of example, you know, radio really competes not only, of course, with other radio stations and radio operators, but with television, with digital and those mediums. And those are the mediums that are capturing the bulk of the advertising spend uh, in this market and other markets around the world as well. So I think it's absolutely crucial that we understand that as we scenario plan, as we build out our strategies, um, that we don't only look at radio operators. Uh, you know, Facebook and Google dominate in the digital space. Television is always going to be an effective mass reach medium. So I think radio's challenge is to keep um, making itself relevant, um, making the case for radio, uh, and helping brands and other advertisers to understand that that two-way interaction uh, and the uniqueness of the medium is absolutely crucial, both at the top and the bottom end of the, of the funnel. That's great from an industry perspective, and then within a prime media broadcasting, how does how is it shaped how you then position your brands? I think you have to be more focused. Okay. Um, so I think you, you know, you have a choice. You either um, position yourself as kind of mass reach, mass appeal, which allows for mass customization of programming content and so on. I'm not sure that you have the opportunity ever to do that in talk radio for the reasons that we've already discussed. So then I think you really do need to understand, you know, our uh, audience profiling um, in our talk formats is predominantly um, people who um, are in the uh, SEMs or old LSM yep. sort of 6 to 10, uh, 7 to 10, that kind of uh, environment. Um, we have very balanced audiences from a demographic point of view uh, on both 702 and Cape Talk. Um, our audiences are skewing younger, which is really good to see, particularly on 702, because I think that uh, there are a lot more of the youth are a lot more engaged yeah. uh, in social issues. So from a programming point of view, we have to adapt our content to make sure that we appeal to that type of listener. And so if the content in the programming skews older all the time or has a heavy ma male bias, as an example, we will alienate large swathes of our current uh, and prospective audiences. A comment. So Jan Erasmus says, I think we've started answering this questions. What, uh, who or what do you see as the main competition of prime media broadcasting, especially to monetize the news? Maybe the last piece would be the one that you could focus on. I'm not sure that monetizing the news is necessarily a competitive issue. I mean, of course it is in the sense that uh, some of the other larger newsrooms in the country, as I mentioned earlier, are beginning to try to monetize their content by placing their premium content behind, um, behind um, the, the firewall. No, th that's what I nearly said earlier, not the <laughs> firewall, the paywall. Um, no, I, I was going to take you up on that because <laughs> I wanted to so know what, what is this fire break we're talking about? <laughs> um, but uh, so I think for us, the, the more germane strategic question is how do we view news in the content, content of radio? Uh, what value does it add to the listening experience? And then again, that will be very different between the musics and the talks. Yeah. Um, and I think you have to find a way to weave in um, an incredible entity like Eyewitness News also into the programming strategy of the business so that you can amplify that content from an analysis and opinion point of view into the shows and therefore get a greater return on the investment that you make in those newsrooms. So maybe let's, let's do a quick case study. Um, a, as we all know, there's been Black Lives Matter in starting uh, with George Floyd in the US. 
uh, where uh, we couldn't breathe and, and people today are still struggling to breathe for different reasons in a COVID context. Now then you come into South Africa, then you have uh, Clix and Tresemme having their own moment, despite all the insight and intelligence and so forth having their moment. So that's something that happens out there. EWN captures it as an opportunity. How does EWN then compete with digital players? As I'm just trying to think about, that's a product opportunity. Society has just gifted you a news item that you can run with. So how competitive can a radio asset be relative to, say, digital assets on a news item like that one? Again, uh, I mean, obviously really important strategic questions. Yeah. I think the first difference between, for me, between digital generically, I mean, it's, you know, digital means is a bit of a nebulous term. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Yeah. But if we talk about the Twitter sphere and those different environments, it's not two-way in the sense that this conversation or talk radio yeah. can be. And again, you know, we are talking about talk radio here. And if you have a responsibility to inform, to educate, and to be, um, to provide a, a place for those exchange, those frank exchange of views so that people can grow and that we can all develop our understanding of different matters, I think it can only happen on radio. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where news becomes and the extension of news becomes so relevant. And, you know, we're all learning all the time. Um, and I have... Um, you know, I think in our business, we realize that the, the kind of issues that you're referring to here um, are not things that you solve in a day and you don't develop a broader understanding and appreciation for different people and different cultures and different societal issues overnight. That requires, first and foremost, I think, an intellectual and a philosophical commitment on a personal level to want to understand and to grow and to understand these things differently. So we do that internally just in terms of who we are as a company and hopefully that comes through the speakers at the end of the day from a talk radio perspective. Thanks for touching on the notion of culture because uh, we, we learn from organizational behavior uh, scholars that culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? So talking about culture, how would you describe Firstly, the current state of the culture in prime media broadcasting and how it has evolved over time. You can take a view, 10 year view, and, and how the current state is positioning you for the future. This is something that's very close to my heart uh, for, for same and other reasons, I suppose. I, I, I just think that as a business, you can't innovate, you can't grow. Um, effectively strategize and execute unless you have a very clear idea of who you are as a company, what you stand for, what your culture is. And ultimately for me it really distills down to very simple things. If people don't enjoy coming to work they're not going to be great at what they do. Uh, they're not going to be inspired, they're not going to be motivated, they're not going to be galvanized. Um, I can't comment on the culture 10 years ago because I've only been in the business for a relatively short period of time. But what I can say is that we saw a fair amount of opportunity in adjusting our culture uh, as principally a driver of employee satisfaction and engagement, which ultimately and unashamedly leads to high performance in an organization. And we've had some many very frank conversations internally directly um, with our employees about where we are uh, and what we need to do. And so in that vein, we hired an external third party company uh, actually from Europe to do independent surveys directly into our staff to interview people directly and to give us the feedback uh, and was candid it was bruising in some instances and I think that that's incredibly healthy uh, for a business uh, and we're on a uh, on a very aggressive journey now and it is a journey because it's um, it's not only about strategy it's also about the essence of who we want to be and we what we want our brands to stand for to make people feel that every voice is important that everybody has a right to be heard um, that homogenous teams, uh, you know, if you look at the performance of diverse teams versus undiverse teams, it's very clear that diverse teams in its broadest possible sense, not only from a demographic perspective, uh, outperform um, teams that are not diverse nine times out of ten. And as an uh, organization, we embrace that. I think that's reflected in our programming strategies. 
Uh, you know, and the other point to make is that, I mean, the presenters are at the forefront of our business. They yeah. are the public facing personas and they generate a great deal of the, um, obviously, of the success that we have. And they're incredibly skilled and they're incredibly informed and diverse. And I think that that is uh, emblematic of what we do internally behind the scenes as well. Yeah. So, um, I I in, in my view, culture is really important, but especially when you're dealing with talented professionals. So I used to work in the investment industry and uh, a saying coming out of the investment industry is like, uh, it's like herding cats because <laughs> you're dealing with extremely intelligent human beings. Mm. Um, sadly, to my former colleagues in the investment industry, in a very narrow aspect of life, <laughs> which is investments, and, and not so intelligent in other aspects of life. I can't say the same about journalists and, 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 and uh, presenters and so forth, because I'm not from that world. But my sense is it must be a bit like herding cats there too. Because in an academic institution, you also have a similar scenario. So I, I run a business of extremely intelligent human beings. In fact, many of them are more qualified than I am, right? And so it does feel like herding cats. So I wonder if, if that metaphor one does apply to your context. And if it does, how do you navigate uh, that scenario? It's a bit like being a, a, a coach of a very successful uh, team and whether it's a rugby team or a soccer team, whatever, where these superstars are the ones that own the brand and they represent the brand, but you as the coach or the leader have to pull it together. So what role do you play in, from a culture perspective in balancing the interests of business um, as a whole and possibly individual interests of the cats, so to speak? You know, you, you bring up a myriad of really interesting... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a tendency in our industry to refer to presenters as talent, yeah. which I have a fundamental problem with. Yeah. And the reason that I do is not that they aren't talented, they're obviously incredibly talented, but we also have another 300 people in our organization who are really talented. And so we try to you know, refer to them as presenters. Uh, and we think that we are blessed with an abundance of talent throughout our organization. And it's actually a term and a phraseology that I've outlawed in our, in our business of late. Um, there's no doubt, of course, that presenters provide that kinetic energy in the organization from a public facing point of view to generate a lot of, uh, of our success, uh, both commercially and in terms of audience numbers and so on. And I think the key to the question that you're asking is to understand that everybody is different. And if you have a business that doesn't only pay lip service to diversity of thought, diversity of opinion, diversity of background and so on, uh, and it isn't something that just resides in values that hang on your wall and is something that you actively integrate into how people are made to feel in the organization and how their value is um, uh, how they contribute value in the business, then I think you adapt your management style depending on the person that you're talking to. The way in which you and I are engaging will be very different to how you engage with people after this uh, and did before this. So for me, with, uh, with our presenters on air, of course, they are an eclectic and very different um, uh, you know, team of incredibly talented people. Um, and they are never going to operate well in a rigid environment that is constricted, that is policy driven and so on. Uh, and I think the balance is somewhere in between. And I, I think for us, our starting point is there is no point in hiring incredibly capable people if you're going to muffle them and not allow them to express what, what makes them so successful. And from a presenter point of view, I think that's crucial, um, that you can put general guardrails in place in terms of this is our strategy from a content point of view, in terms of our niche audiences and so on. But you've got to let presenters do their thing because that's the magic that they bring to any organization. So this is a business school. So we drill down on a point until we exhaust it. It's like a case study. I can't tell. A, living, a living case study. <laughs> so in that context, imagine I'm a CEO that in a different industry that is also herding cats um, and wants to just get like one or two bits of insight and wisdom about behind the scenes. I was reading an interview about uh, behind the scenes with uh, Gerard and Chris Williams. Um, this is before you had your haircut. <laughs> so I want to go behind the scenes of the leader and, and say, help us to, what advice would you give to other herders of cats? 
So in addition to say in your context, it's about allowing people to be with few braces. What else can, we, can you give us more insights in terms of from a leadership lessons perspective? I, I would suggest embrace it. Um, I, I think that there, you know, in South Africa, I think there's still quite traditional management models. If you look at the composition of boards across uh, South Africa, they're dominated by chartered accountants and so on, which I intuitively understand. But I think there also has to be a recognition um, that people with tremendous creative capability, the ability to innovate, uh, the ability to pivot incredibly quickly actually strongly aligns with more quantitative models built around things like business agility and so on. Um, and I think you have to embrace it and I think you have to find ways to create multifunctional teams that are much more effective at solving and unlocking problems than uh, generic teams are. So for me, embrace it. I think from a, a management and a leadership point of view, it often can be a, a big learning curve for you, but I think that's the point is that we all learn from one another. So for me, I, I would embrace it with open arms. Lovely. So let's go back away from the leader, back into the organization. I suppose given um, all that is happening in the media industry and this commercialization issues we discussed earlier, a crucial question we ought to reflect on is how do business people like you balance commercial interests with editorial independence? So what happens when... Um, a brand like Clix has big advertising uh, with uh, your platforms and then some of your presenters, uh, not talent, some of your presenters um, then take them on, whether it's on the entertainment assets or whether it's on the, 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 the talk and, and news and learning assets. How do you balance it such that, uh, so who wins in that debate if, if there is such a winner? Or is there a mechanism for balancing? Take us through that process, please. I think that that's, um, I think there are a few fundamentals that you have to use as your, your North Star to guide you in those debates. Uh, and this is, it's so interesting, the, the timing. This is a debate we had in as, as an executive team yesterday. Um, I think there are a couple of simple fundamentals. If you have to err, you must err on the side of editorial independence. So if you're ever in doubt, err on the side of editorial independence. If you do something, for me, the litmus test is, are you happy to appear on the front page of the Sunday newspapers and have this debated or not? If you're not, don't do it. Are you happy to sit down with your child when you read them a bedtime story and say, this is what I did today at work, and if you think you're going to see disappointment in their eyes or you don't want to tell them the story, don't do it. So we use a couple of really simple, ethical uh, litmus tests when we make those decisions. I think some practical examples of it would be that we do not bow to pressure from our advertising clients. So to the extent that they are going through the types of hardships that you've mentioned, we will perhaps advise them. We will say, perhaps here's a brand strategy for you to bring to air to deal with these issues, but confront them, be honest about them, be a bit vulnerable. That's what radio, talk radio particularly is about. Uh, and I think our presenters are excellent at balancing their approach in those, in those situations. But I don't think that you can afford, for instance, to uh, have a show dedicated to uh, a particular motor vehicle or driving across Africa, or whatever it is, and then have that show content sponsored by a particular automotive uh, manufacturer and then to seed in their advertising. I think that's inappropriate because I think what it does is it starts to erode the trust that the listener has with you as a talk radio station. So when I listen to talk radio, I listen because I want as much objectivity as possible and I want to learn. If I think, however uh, inaccurately, that the content may have been unduly and subliminally influenced, unintentionally influenced by the presence of an advertiser or a client, then I think you, that you, you're, you're missing the plot and I think you need to rethink. So I wonder if I could be a bit philosophical um, and ask a question that I'm going to struggle to articulate, but hopefully as we discuss it, it will get clearer. In the context of that truth, do you think truth can be objective and therefore harmless, or is there a space for taking a side in the context of a newsroom? And I know a lot of this conversation is around a newsroom. Because I'm, I'm trying to basically articulate is, is 
is this notion of independence really the gold standard? Or is there a, a, a place for saying we take a view in this particular newsroom? I don't think there's a one-fits-all answer. Uh, and I do think the answer is different from a talk radio point of view, from a newsroom point okay. of view. Um, and I, I do, by the way, think that corporate South Africa and advertisers have a big role to play in news and the quality of news, and perhaps we can come to that in yeah. a minute. Um, but from my perspective, you know, the again, I think it's just about understanding that if you aren't balanced, and this is one of the, the foundational um, aspects of the fourth estate, if you aren't balanced and if you aren't at least trying very hard to retain your objectivity, I think you lose your credibility. Having said that, I think that there are unambiguous instances in our country and in any country where you have to take a position and you have to take a stand. And I think we've seen that in our recent history and how that's been the catalyst for really much stronger citizen uh, um, activeness and engagement um, and developing a society that's far more engaged. So I do think that there are unambiguous moments where as brands, as companies, and as, as um, a newsroom, you can take a position to say, this is simply unacceptable uh, because it threatens our democracy and we have to take a, a stance. Lovely. So let's build on the comment that you are making regarding um, the role of corporate South Africa and the newsroom and the quality of the newsroom. Where were you going with that? I think the linkage really um, is more perhaps a moral one which is, and let's, uh, instead of referring to corporate so South Africa, let's talk about advertisers yeah. uh, in the broadest possible sense. I think we're at a point as a country where, you know, SANAF, which I think does absolutely fantastic work, uh, is um, making representations to government to say, not only have newsrooms been quite precariously positioned for the last while from a financial point of view, but this has been hugely exacerbated by COVID and we've seen this. We've seen the retrenchments. We've seen uh, what's happened to the newsrooms around, around the country. Um, and so I think that this is the right time for government to step in and help, uh, and, and help fund um, media in this country to make sure that it, it remains viable. But apart from that, I think people should start making more morally informed choices of where they place their advertising. And we've seen this, you know, through the, the last dispensation of, of government where particular media um, outlets and formats have been favoured in terms of advertising revenues to keep them afloat to achieve whatever objectives it was that they were after. And so where you have newsrooms which are fiercely committed to independence and to editorial quality and independence, I think that that's where the advertising rand should go. And I think that should be a deliberate choice. Lovely. So you mentioned COVID. Um, and there's, we can go to town talking about COVID. I wonder if I could ask one targeted question um, and have perhaps some authority to ask it, given that we both are on the wrong side of this question that I'm going to ask, is that my reading um, of the impact of COVID on productivity in the workplace is that uh, we are going to go through a phase in the next short while where many of the productivity gains informed by gender diversity are going to be lost. Um, where women are taking on a lot more responsibility at home, a lot more than you and I do. So we might both be working at home, but our potential, our spouses, assuming we're both heterosexual, I don't want to assume heteronormality, uh, 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 taking on more family responsibility, particularly with young children and so forth. And as a result, um, certainly in Europe and the US, they're seeing a lot, a dislocation around gender and the workplace and productivity. And I wonder if any of that is playing out in, this, in, in, in the South African media industry, or any of it is also playing out within prime media broadcasting. And if it is, uh, if, you have started to grapple with how, as a leadership team, can start addressing that. Because certainly something we are grappling with in our context to be a lot more supportive of our female colleagues 
because we recognize that in a heteronormal world, um, it's still unequal, and women carry a lot more of the load in the home front than, than we do men in the home front. Uh, it's a big mouthful, it's a bit of a speech, but nonetheless, see where you go with it. I think um, heteronormal is quite a controversial term. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think within our context, we're only beginning to glean those learnings. Um, it, it, last week, for instance, we did a survey into all of our staff asking them how they've responded to work from anywhere. Well, really work from home, I suppose, during the lockdown, but what will evolve into work from anywhere. Um, and understanding where their productivity um, is from at the office versus at home. I mean, the results have been absolutely fascinating with a very strong bias to working from home for improved productivity. I think obviously there's been an evolution of the roles in a household. Um, you know, I have a very clearly demarcated space uh, in the basement that I'm allowed to work out of. Uh, but the fact that I'm working and at home doesn't mean uh, that I don't have responsibilities, additional responsibilities I, I need to take on. My wife has her own career. And I think that there has been a leveling of the play, playing fields within relationships, but also beginning to manifest in the workplace, which I think is hugely positive and important. I think we've got a lot to learn as an employer, as employers around the country, uh, as to how this manifests in day-to-day -day life for people and how we can offer that level of support. Um, I think one of the invidious balances that we're going to try and strike, that we need to strike, is the reality that I think the, the, the world of work has changed irrevocably and correctly so, and we need to understand and accept that. We need to protect our ability to perform and to outperform as a business, and my sense is that that requires a lot more balance in terms of people not coming into the office. I think that we need to be very clear that we're supportive of the women who work for us, who are mothers uh, and who have the additional burdens that you've referred to. But you also can't build culture over Zoom and you can't spark teams over Zoom and you can't induct and orientate new employees over Zoom. So I think it's one of the biggest challenges we're going to face in the next couple of years is, is how do we unlock that increased potential of our employees and uh, of us as an organization but at the same time, always aspiring to be a more caring and considerate employer. So there is a plug for the academic community. Over the past 10, if not 15 years, uh, there has been a, a growing literature on global value teams, right? And, 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 and how you might actually do all the things that you're saying can't be done over Zoom. Because it's not just about the medium, it's also about the message and how you package the message in the process. So you're welcome to come and we can have a, a master class on how to build global value teams, virtual teams, and so forth and so forth. Um, I've got a, a barrage of questions. Uh, one maybe not so nice, uh, but nonetheless, I'm gonna, it's up to you. Yay or nay, answer them as you see fit. So let me go online. Ashraf Garda, uh, your form, I think is a former colleague, he might still be a colleague of yours, um, says, as a talk show host myself, now heads up the Champion South Africa movement. I've really enjoyed this conversation. What is clear beyond the spontaneity of live radio is very intentional, deliberate plan. That's champion thinking. So I think that was just a comment. So Ashraf is obviously happy with what you and I are doing. Thanks, Ashraf. I, I'm a fan of yours. And so if you think we're doing a good job, I'm very happy. And then you've got uh, Puluko Malepe says, please ask him, I still don't know how to say your name, Understandably. Geraint, <laughs> about uh, Eusebius Makeza. What happened? That's it, question mark. Yeah. I, I don't know if you, it's a question you're comfortable to answer, or yes or no, it's up to you. No, I'm, I'm happy to answer. I think, I mean, in, uh, I'd rather speak about, uh, you know, the repositioning of 702, which is really what the question is about, yeah. I think. Um, for the very first time in January this year, 702 launched listener surveys, uh, and the biggest uh, of their kind, uh, and canvassed 4,000 listeners, and asked them what they thought of the product, what they yeah. thought of the station, what they thought of the lineup, what they thought of, of how we put this together. Um, and for the very first time, we evolved the offering in accordance with listener feedback, which is, you would think, obvious, uh, but also crucial. Um, but we hadn't done enough of it. 
and that triggered various changes across the organization through the lineup, through programming. If you listen, if you are a consumer of 702, and I'm convinced that you are. <laughs> um, I must be, right? Then you, <laughs> then you will have noticed that, uh, that we made some, some very deliberate changes. Yeah. Um, but the short answer with Eusebius was that his contract period came to an end and yeah. he decided not to renew yeah. and pursued other opportunities. And we wish him all the very best of luck with those. Well, I must say, uh, I, 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 I was sad to see uh, Eusebius go because I found him to be engaging. Um, uh, I didn't always agree with his worldview, which is just as well, because if I did, then I'd be in an echo chamber. Mm. Um, but I am very happy with John in the afternoons because... As I said, uh, as, unless I'm wrong, John and I went to Woodmead High at different times, so I'm not as old as John. <laughs> Sorry, John. <laughs> In fact, we're both Woodmedians, and so I'm very happy to see that there's somebody who can claim some, some sense of ownership uh, who also is part of, uh, of that great family. So now let's go to uh, L.I. Lee Ndube, who says, Good point on diluting the excessive power of accountants. The excessive power accountants have in business leadership. It is reasonable to recognize leaders that can deliver directly uh, to, the, to the productive output of the business. So maybe that's just a comment. Um, there was an earlier comment about talent. That's Clady Maketa. How does Pi Prime Media retain talent when there is a major fight for talent from both local and foreign competition, not just involving broadcasters? So, yeah. so I presume the talent can be broadly of course, yeah. uh, defined. In I, think it's, I think it's a, a, a question that every company faces and, and it's an absolutely crucial linchpin in the performance of any business and I, I think um, he is absolutely right to that yeah. question. I think first of all uh, you have to understand what innately inspires, motivates uh, and, and attracts people to stay and firstly to join your organization and then stay. Uh, and it's not news to any of us that it's not money, for, first and foremost. That, of course, is important in terms of the hierarchy of needs, but it's not the first thing. I think it's about how you treat people. I think it's about giving people growth opportunities. I would say that if you aren't developing people, I had a conversation with a, a producer who joined us last week, and one of the first questions I asked him is, what's your next job? Where do you want to be next, and how can I help you get there? And I think that's what you've got to do as an employer. And you've got to understand that the more you make your employees successful, the more successful you become. And, you know, speaking for myself, if I'm in a business where I feel valued, where I feel I have a contribution to make, and that you're going to invest in me and grow me, performance, yeah. uh, performance dependent, uh, I'll be around for a long time. Right. Which may or may not be a good thing. Awesome. So I've got a question here from Nomonde White and Glovo, one of our alumnus at Gibbs. So she says, so Paul was one of the first leaders I've worked for who cares about the detail. Let's see. Hopefully we know we're going to get to who Paul is. He literally moved buildings so that he could be closer to the delivery teams and insisted and encouraged teams to talk to him directly. And uh, uh, da, 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 da. How is this related to us, Asogren, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I went into the wrong email. Let's go to Katie. There we go. Uh, Stefan uh, Dalapria says, what's the story with the so-called mistreatment of employees? Ooh, okay. I should have read that before I read it out. I.e. all the drama around Aki seems there's a people versus management struggle and it's public. That's Stefan Dalapria. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a, an inaccurate characterization of what's transpired. And again, I'll speak to the issues. Yeah. So this is with reference to a Section 189 process that the business has gone through. Uh, and, and this is across the group, by the way. This is not just Prime Media Broadcasting and certainly is not unique to us. I think the, you know, the reflection is, and some of this obviously sp spilled over into the public domain. And I think that's inevitable when you're a public facing business. And yeah. I understand it. Um, and I don't think that we must be proprietorial about these things. I think we have to understand that uh, I would imagine that there were a vast number of companies in this country and globally who went through the awful realization for the first time that they couldn't keep everybody employed and that they had to make tough decisions. Uh, and I think as with anything, when you do it for the first time or the second time or the third time, there are learnings and there are lessons. And we are an organization that is super focused on being a learning organization. And we haven't arrived, and I hope we never do. 
So in this 189 process, despite all our efforts and everything we did um, to manage it as carefully and as sensitively as what we could, there were some places that we made mistakes. And, and I think that's a reference to one of them, quite correctly so. And so we've sat down, the management team has sat down and worked out, hopefully we don't ever get back into this position again, uh, but how do we manage this better? And I think the inherent balance that the team struggled with is where you have a business that has very strong public facing engaging platforms and, and presenters and personalities. Um, how do you manage that process with them compared to the myriad of other people in the organization who have also been loyal to it for 10 years and 20 years and 30 years? And that's quite difficult to navigate. However, having said all of that, there are no excuses and that, you know, we've got to do better as an employer every time we do something. Uh, and that's certainly the commitment that we make, both to our, you know, our past and, and current and prospective employees. Yeah. Look, I, I can empathize with both sides. I can empathize with the message that you're giving us, and, but equally, I can empathize with the listening public like myself because we fall in love with these people, right? Absolutely. So they, they, to us, they're not employees. They, are, um, they, they become part of our families, right? So one of my school friends, I uh, haven't seen him for a while, but I remember when we finished school, his name is Fana Mukwena, um, and, um, and I remember I was walking with him in the Free State, and uh, it's about 25 odd years ago. And then somebody says, oh, I know you. <laughs> You're in my living room. And at that stage, he yeah. was an actor, right? And so yeah. obviously people then own you. It's a proprietary thing. So we, and we, I think you want that. Yes, you, you know, do, and right? I, because I think that from particularly in this instance, yeah. a talk radio perspective, you know, people can only listeners can only like you if they know you. So yeah. they've got to get to know you, yeah. which also implies a degree of vulnerability yeah. on air. And, and I think that that's a responsibility that we also carry as an employer and yeah. something that we've got to be very aware of. Yeah. So as we think of ending off, um, and I just want to build on uh, um, the, the question from Amos Tabane, uh, who says, uh, Prime Media is known as a pioneer in broadcasting. He puts it with a capital P, although there's another company that might take offense to that uh, Amos because they are called Pioneer. Uh, uh, what can we expect from the group in the next five years as shaping behavior and attitudes towards broadcasting? Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Um, some of this I'm not going to be able to talk about. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> tell us. It's only the two of in, us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. We'll have you on air next week and say the same. Uh, I think, um, look, I think radio is at a little inflection point at the moment. Um, it was so interesting to see, you know, we have what we would suggest is a, a leading research and insights team in the broadcasting business. And in the lockdown, radio consumption increased. And within that, talk radio listenership increased. And that was because I think people had a thirst for knowledge, what was going on, how do you deal with this pandemic, and so on and so forth. And now we're seeing that alter slightly as well. So I think it's such a fluid environment. I think for us to make sure that radio remains relevant, particularly in the face of data at some point becoming much cheaper and ubiquitous, it has to keep reinventing itself. I think the inevitable provision of content on digital platforms, moving into streaming surface, uh, services much more aggressively is something that, that terrestrial radio has to do. And to find ways to engage newer audiences in newer ways to stay relevant, I think is a, a key strategic question for, for all radio operators. Lovely. So I look forward to watching the journey of Prime Media Broadcasting, this learning organization. So I'm glad I know that because we too, even though we are producers of learning. We too are a learning organization here at Gibbs um, as part of the University of Pretoria. Um, and so I can see opportunities going forward for us to all learn together in this space. Um, so allow me to maybe perhaps end off where I started, which is at the personal, all right? And, and say, um, so as we conclude, and if there are younger people watching this, um, uh, this conversation, participating in the conversation. Help us to understand what got you into the media field and that which got you, is it still keeping you in the media? And, and if it disappears, 
what would take you out of the media space? So what is that purpose that keeps you locked into this field of media, this morning zoo that we all wake up to? So I think you need a lot of luck. Um, honestly, every um, person that I've met who's had any success attributes a lot of it to luck. In that instance, that was the case for me. Uh, I was working in a company that landed up being acquired by Prime Media. And that's how I got my opportunity um, and worked my way up through the, through the organization. Uh, I was working at Stir Clinical Theatres. My first job was a box office cashier selling tickets. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and Prime Media bought Stir Clinical. Um, I think what absolutely fascinates me and entraps me about media is the ability that you have to touch people's lives. Uh, and the responsibility that comes with that. And for me, that is something that uh, I wake up every day to do. It is, uh, our business is made up of the most phenomenal people. Uh, a lot of the reason that I go to work every day uh, in Prime Media is because of the quality of people that, that you work with. I find them absolutely inspirational. And we have the opportunity, uh, and it's not lost on us, it's very front of mind for all of us, to help shape a much more positive society uh, and a much more successful country and I think we all have a responsibility to pitch in and if you are fortunate enough to work in media you have almost direct connectivity between the messages and and the conversations that you have and the messages that you impart and positivity and engagement and a sense of uh, of citizen um, of citizens who um, are invested in this journey that we have as a country and that excites me tremendously Lovely. So as I conclude, um, so I live just off Jan Smuts. I think we're quite neighbors. And a few years ago when my kids were much smaller, uh, the 90, then 94.7 cycle race um, mm. would come down Jan Smuts. Um, and because um, I'm at the top in park in forest, what's it called? Forest Town. <laughs> and, and I'd sit with my then five year old and seven year old and um, it's like 10 years ago, uh, yeah. watching um, in our PJs. And then my five-year-old said, Dad, why aren't you doing this? Look at these big guys, <laughs> and they are doing it to yourself. So I look forward as we unlock beyond COVID to see more cycle challenges, more walk the talks, more community events, and look forward to the wonderful work that you do to create a more positive worldview, certainly a more positive South Africa. So whether they call you Gerrit or Gerant or whatever, Gerant, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. Thank you. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed it too. From what I could see, there are lots of people online who said thank you for being authentic and for not ducking and diving and taking all the questions. Thank so you thank for you having very me. Much. I've enjoyed it very much, Morris. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. See you again.